All right, so our Lewis dot structures gave us a great look at how atoms are connected in order to form a molecule. And so they do give us a great two-dimensional look at these molecules. VESPER, which stands for the Valence Shell Pair Electron Repulsion Theory, predicts the shapes of molecules or polyatomic ions. And this is all based on Again, the electron pairs are going to arrange themselves to minimize repulsions. Electrons are negatively charged, and they, like charges, repel each other. So when you have these domains or regions of electrons around a central atom in a molecule, they're going to place themselves at the furthest distance as possible, the best, the most favorable bond angles possible, in order for that molecule to be at the lowest energy state. So when we have a central atom, the arrangement of these electron pairs gives us the electron geometry. And these are what we call the ideal geometries. You have a, yes, ideal geometry, sorry. You have a central atom that is surrounded by all bonds. There's only bonding electrons around the central atom, no lone pairs. So if we have a central atom surrounded by two atoms, that would be a linear position. You'd have 180 degree separation between the atoms. If we have a central atom with three atoms around it, that would be trigonal planar. And we would have a nice 120 degree angle between the three atoms surrounding the central atom. If an atom is surrounded by four different atoms, that is what we call a tetrahedral situation, and that's 109.5 degree bond angles. Our violators of the octet rule, sometimes we might have five or six different atoms around the central atom, and then we would have trigonal pyramidal, because essentially it's like you have two pyramids, top and bottom, and also an octahedral situation. So again, these are what we call ideal geometries if our central atom is totally surrounded by bonded atoms, bonding electrons. Now when we take a picture or take a look at these molecules, we get the molecular shape. Because when we image molecules, we see the nuclear positions. Now here's a fascinating little picture taken back in May 30th on, on May 30th, 2013, the first ever high resolution images of a molecule as it breaks and reforms chemical bonds. And the interesting thing here is when you actually look at these actual images, they very much resemble the flat structures, the two dimensional structures we draw. And they also resemble the lovely little model kits if we use the model kits to put them together. And so it's interesting to see that indeed our Vesper shape predictions are actually experimentally being proven and we can see them. So again, what we see are nuclear positions and that is the molecular shape. Now, the electron geometry and the shape will be the same if we have all bonds around the central atom and those would be our ideal geometries. If we have lone pairs, non-bonding electrons, around the central atom as well, they are going to alter the ideal geometry. And so, for example, if we have a tetrahedral that we see here, when there's four atoms around the central atom, that's an ideal geometry, then it's tetrahedral shape if we would image that molecule. However, if this atom was replaced with a lone pair, then we would end up with a trigonal pyramidal shape. And you could see like this is where the atom would have been in a tetrahedral, but now it's not there. And so we have a trigonal pyramidal shape of that molecule if we imaged it. Furthermore, if we took another atom away, then we would end up with a bent shape. And so we would have these two lone pairs accounting for the bent shape of the molecule. But when we image that, 
we would not see the lone pairs. We just see the nuclear positions. We would see a bent molecule. Okay, and so from our ideal geometries, we get some of these other shapes like seesaw or square based pyramid or T shaped or bent or trigonal pyramidal. Okay. So typically what you might be asked to do, like we're going to do in our molecular geometry model building lab, is you're given a molecule. And so you should first count the valence electrons for that molecule. And then of course we should draw the Lewis structure, which gives us the nice flat arrangement of the atoms. Of course, if we had to, use formal charges to make sure you're picking the best Lewis structure available. Once you have your Lewis structure, then you want to determine the number of electron domains around the central atom, and that will tell you your, your geometry. So again, these electron geometries match our ideal geometries. So if there's two, atom, two domains around the central atom, it would be linear. Three is trigonal planar. Four is tetrahedral. Five, trigonal bipyramidal. And six would be octahedral. Okay, again, those are the electron domains. They could be either atoms or lone pairs. Then, you will use Vesper to determine the molecular shape and the bond angles. So again, if all the domains are bonds, the ideal geometry is the same as the molecular shape. The electron geometry is the same as the molecular shape. That would be one of our ideal geometries. If we have lone pairs, then we would have a different shape. And then you can determine the bond angles from those shapes. And there's a few you just need to know. Linear is 180, trigonal pyramidal 120, tetrahedral 109.5, etc. Then we come across this orbital hybridization on the central atom. And where this comes from is the valence bond theory. And again, a theory is there to try to explain what we see in nature. And so this valence bond theory is trying to explain what's happening to the electrons in a bond in order to get these different different molecules. The best example I can think of is let's say carbon. Okay. So if we have carbon and we are, you know, just talking about good old fashioned carbon. How many valence electrons does carbon have? And we can all pretty much say four. And then we say how many bonds does carbon usually form? Well, of course, four. Carbon loves to have four bonds, whether it be four single bonds, two double bonds, a triple bond and a single bond, whatever. But we say four bonds. Great. What's the electron configuration of carbon? Six electrons, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Fantastic. Well, when we did our little orbital diagrams when we talked about electron configuration, this is what we saw as the orbital diagram for carbon. 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Looking at that, doesn't that look like it should only form two bonds? Because those two electrons are ready to be shared? Harumph! And this is where the orbital hybridization comes in. Methane, CH4 that you see here, our simplest carbon compound. When we experimentally look at this molecule, we do see that there, there are identical bonds, identical bond lengths. Again, there's some controversy in this world of orbital hybridization, whether or not we should be talking about them or not, whether or not they even exist. But it's a good theory that helps explain, and so we, it's still being used today, especially for the um, simpler hybridizations. And it does kind of make sense when you think about it, because looking at the orbital diagram, it does look like carbon should only share two. So what happens? We know that CH4 exists. We know that carbon forms four bonds. How can we explain it? And that's what the valence bond theory does a job trying to do. Oh, sorry, I must have passed it. Where am I going? Come on, come on. 
there we go here's a little animation so here is our carbon there's two electrons in the 2s and one in each of the 2p so what ends up happening or we say happens is that an electron is promoted from the 2s to the 2p and then now these four electrons those orbitals hybridize and create four identical what we call sp3 orbitals in the 3d world okay we've got 2p orbitals in the x y and z plane and we've got our 2s orbital and they merge together and hybridize and that's what we're saying and what it ends up looking like is we have four what we call sp3 hybrid orbitals that have some s characteristic and some p characteristic now if one s orbital and one p hybridize we call them sp orbitals one s and two p's we call them sp2 if we involve the d's like if there's a central atom with five things around it we say that's sp3 d and if there's six sp3 d2 right, again this is a theory helping to explain the phenomenon that we see and so we are still asked on the AP exam about orbital hybridization typically though just sp sp2 or sp3 The other things we can do then, once we have our Lewis diagram and answer all those questions, in the lab we can use the model kits to construct a three-dimensional model, or we can use the computer, and we might be asked to sketch a 3D representation, typically not on the AP exam, but I will in our little lab activity. And the last piece of the puzzle is, using electronegativities and dipole moments, we need to determine if the molecule or polyatomic ion is polar or nonpolar. Okay, again, we have electronegativities, electronegativities for all of our different atoms, and based on the difference of those electronegativities, we can determine whether a bond is polar or nonpolar. Typically, we talk about a differentiation of 0.4 or less being nonpolar. So, like the carbon hydrogen bond is typically thought of as being nonpolar because it's a difference of 0.4. Some people out there say it's very slightly polar, but for the most part we agree that carbon hydrogen is nonpolar. Fluorine, of course, anything covalently bonded to fluorine is typically a polar bond because fluorine is the most electronegative element. And then anything greater than 0.4 we will say is a polar bond. So we can draw dipole moments on the bonds. The arrows always point towards the more electronegative atom. And then based on those dipole moments, we can determine whether or not a molecule is polar or nonpolar. The electronegativities, the differences talk about whether the bond is polar or not. Now we have to determine if the molecule is. You can look at your book for this. I've given you some other resources. You can go online, but essentially First off, if there are no polar bonds whatsoever in the molecule, then the molecule is definitely nonpolar. If there is one polar bond in the molecule, then the molecule is definitely polar, like here. I've got the carbon chlorine bond is polar, the carbon hydrogens are nonpolar. So if there's one polar bond, one dipole moment in the molecule, then it's definitely polar. If there's two or more dipoles, then it's going to be based on shape. If you have a symmetrical shape, like our ideal geometries, then the dipoles cancel out. So here we see carbon tetrachloride. Even though there's four dipoles, this is a symmetrical shape tetrahedral, so the molecule is nonpolar. Trigonal planar, nonpolar. Okay, so you'll have to determine whether or not the molecule is based on the shape if there's two or more dipoles. Alright, I hope this helps and I'll see you soon.